and why they're way cool. While apron and fishes are much different than what we normally think of a typical fish. So here we have a trout, puts in water, breathes water, just does normal fishing thing. Just. However, everything fishes are much different than this trout. Here we have a mangrove killifish, which is found in Southeast Asia. And this fish, an air breather, actually likes to spend time out of water. This one's actually just hanging out in an empty log. So it's much, much different than what you normally think of a typical fish. So everything fishes are incredibly diverse. And it's not just one type of fish or one group of fish that live in the same place. It's actually many different groups and many, many different species of fishes. And just to introduce you to a couple, everything fishes actually include some of the largest freshwater fish in the world. Now you may not have heard these ones before, but this is Arapaima. It's found in the Brazilian Amazon. And it can get up to four and a half meters long and 200 kilos. That's incredibly big, over 15 feet. 440 pounds. And another one that's a little bit closer to here, uh, found in uh, southern United States, is the alligator gar. So again, it can get up to about two and a half meters and 150 kilos, a massive fish. So where we think fishes are actually only a relatively small number of the total groups of uh, total fish. So there's about 65,000 vertebrate species in total, so a lot of vertebrate species. And amazingly, half of these are fish. Everything fishes, however, are only about one, one and a half percent of the total fish species. So depending on who's doing the count, you get 400, 450 fishes. So if you would think all these fish in this water, one of these would be an air breathing fish. So they're actually not really that many proportionally. But I'm going to try to introduce you guys to a couple uh, of five different species in a bit more detail. Some that you may have heard of and just not realize that they're an air breathing fish, or maybe you've never heard of them at all. But okay, here we have a mud skipper. And this guy's pretty cool because they uh, actually use their pectoral fins to walk around on land. They actually like to spend time on land. So sometimes uh, some of these species, especially a number of mud skipper species, but some of them. If you put them in water, they'll actually go back on land. They like to spend time on land. You know, they're quite amphibious, so they're more like an amphibian, like a frog or a salamander in that regard. But they're actually related to gobies, which are very common uh, in fish that are water-breathing uh, uh, group of fishes. And these guys are found in the intertidal habitat in mangroves, often in mangroves, so quite often in areas in red here, in yellow, uh, so Southeast Asia, Australia, parts of Africa, and India. <coughs> these are kind of neat because they actually make a world in these mud flats. So here we got a mud skipper, and in these mud flats, they can actually dig up holes and create these burrows where they can hide from predators and deposit eggs. And another really neat thing is that they'll actually take air from the surface gulp it, and release it into these uh, whirls here to create a bit of an airspace so that they can breathe. So the next one I'm going to show you is the electric eel. So who's heard of an electric eel before? Yeah? Okay. Uh, you guys know like, that they're pretty, uh, they can be pretty dangerous. They produce these electric currents using these electric organs. These electric organs are called electrocytes. And they're basically a series of cells that act like a battery. Now these cells can produce a current of about 600 volts when released. So this is about five times the strength of, if I were to stick my finger in an electrical plug, it would be five times that shock. So that kind of shock could actually knock a horse off its feet. That's pretty powerful. And it could probably even like show an older person or a younger person or somebody with a heart problem. Uh, one of the uh, professors that, uh, here at UBC, well, he's a Maritai, but when he was working in the um, Brazilian Amazon in the 70s, they actually uh, got uh, shocked when they were on the boat. They were working with these animals and he brought them up and I guess, I don't know what he was doing, but he uh, somehow got 
that by one of these things, and apparently it was, uh, it was pretty, it was pretty scary for him. It was just uh, out in the middle of the uh, Amazon River, and you get that. So it's pretty, uh, pretty scary. These guys aren't actually a true eel; they're more related to carp. So they just have an eel-like body, and they're so dependent on air breathing that they will actually drown. So just like if you or I were to go swimming and get at the bottom and don't come up for air, we'll drown. These guys are the same way, so they need to breathe air. So as mentioned, they're found in the Amazon River Basin of South America, primarily in Brazil. And the next fish I'm going to introduce you to is the South American lungfish. Again, from South, oh, South America. And uh, this one's kind of neat because uh, when the uh, first biologists were going up uh, the rivers, they found this creature. And they couldn't figure out if it was a fish, if it was an amphibian, it kind of acted like a bit of an amphibian, it moved on land, it was breathing air, but then it had many characteristics of a fish. And so it basically presented a paradox. What do we call it? Well, they ended up naming it Lepocyron paradoxa, because they just didn't know at the time. But we do know now that it's, uh, it's actually, well, it is a fish. And it shares more characteristics with fish than uh, amphibian. But interestingly, lungfish are actually more closely related to tetrapods. So like amphibians, reptiles, mammals, and birds than other fishes. And one of the things that uh, uh, we know that from, from their limbs, their limbs are actually, although they're much more rudimentary than our arms and legs, they actually share a lot of the similar characteristics that we have. And this allows them to kind of basically walk where they can use their limbs to push themselves on water. Uh, again, they're so found in South America. They're actually, the range actually extends a bit more in southern uh, Brazil into the, uh, the swamps and the uh, Pantanal. So this little clip shows you these lungfish uh, in this aquarium kind of walking along the bottom of the tank. So its limbs are incredibly weak, though. They don't have developed muscles or anything like that. But you can see the, the front two limbs, and then there's uh, two rear limbs. They kind of use this to kind of walk along the bottom. So it's pretty neat. So the next one is uh, the snakehead. And I'm sure some of you guys have heard about the snakehead, especially if you live in Burnaby, um, Burnaby Lake, something like that. So snakeheads are a very good example of a uh, very successful everything fish. And they're very successful, and they're also very invasive. So these guys are actually very detrimental to ecosystems where they're not native to. And so anybody can recall a couple years ago, they were talking about these fishzilla, uh, the frankenfish, hair and the people of British Columbia. So somebody made a very poor decision and decided to take the snakehead from his tank, presumably because it got too big, and put it in Burnaby Lake, and it'll give it a nice home. Well, it's not a very good idea, because this fish can basically devour everything and anything that, it's most, that will fit in its mouth. And it can actually make its way across land to other water bodies. So uh, imagine maybe the fish leaving Burnaby Lake and entering the Fraser River system. That'd be pretty bad. These guys can produce copious amounts of egg, reproduce very quickly, and if they can eat everything and anything, that's going to decimate the salmon populations and other trout. It would be really bad for British Columbia. And in fact, they've actually spread across the United States quite a bit. All these little circles are uh, either uh, sighted or established population. So quite often, uh, especially for the uh, Asian food market, people will produce them in agriculture ponds, and often, Sometimes they escape and they enter local waterways and they end up reproducing. And this little quote says, you know, entire waterways have been taken over in the southern United States and the local species decimated. And this individual is saying, you know, it actually takes small animals. And if you had a chihuahua or a small dog, didn't know if you'd want it in the vicinity of this fish. Imagine walking your little dog and, okay, I'll have a little drink. And the snakehead comes up and eats it. I'm sure that probably doesn't actually happen, but. The, uh, northern, the northern variety can actually get about one and a half meter in length. So that's uh, bigger than a small child. 
So, never been any reports of snake heads actually eating or attacking people like that. But, kind of makes you realize that, yeah, maybe these guys are a little bit dangerous. So the next fish is actually the one that I had, same species that I had on the first slide. This is the beta fish, also commonly uh, referred to as a Siamese fighting fish, because if you have uh, two males in the same tank, they will actually uh, compete with each other to fight, and potentially uh, one will kill the other. So these fish are actually uh, very common in aquarium, uh, aquarium stores or pet stores. They usually sell them in like little tiny glasses and probably like, I don't know, barely any water, probably just as much water as there's fish in some of these and sell them for like five or six bucks. But they're incredibly beautiful and have many different colorations. And the other really, I think, neat thing about them is that they're incredibly easy to care for. Although a lot of people neglect them, they're actually, uh, they don't need a lot of care in a sense because they are air breeders and they're actually just very, very tough fish, which makes them really easy to keep. Uh, these fish are actually uh, native to Southeast Asia, uh, the Mekong River Basin, which includes uh, Cambodia, Vietnam, Laos, and Thailand. And they're found in the, uh, like the canals, the uh, transportation canals, uh, rice paddies, and other flooded fields around there. So, beta fish have a unique behavior that's kind of cool, that's related to their air breathing ability, and it's that males can build bubble nests. So, males take out air and uh, release it into these uh, nests by taking the mucus, the saliva, saliva mucus secretion, and can form these nice little bubbles and create these nests. And uh, so the males exhibit parental care, which is actually fairly unique amongst fish, and gives the offspring a higher rate of uh, survival. So I showed you like, five different species, and uh, they're all very quite different, but they do have the one thing in common, which I'm sure you mentions the uh, breathe air. But how do they breathe air? How does a fish normally breathe? Anybody have any idea how a fish normally breathes? Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, so they take up oxygen from the water across the hill. So in uh, most water breathing fish, water enters them out crosses the gill, so the gill covering is the perculum. And so as uh, water flows through, it'll flow through the gill filaments, which will make up the gills. And in the gill filaments, so in the gill filaments are blood vessels. And so as the blood goes through the gill filaments, water passes over, and they take up oxygen. So from there, Oxygen is transported to the tissues. So, enters the gills, goes to the tissues, taken up, and when we take up oxygen, we end up releasing a byproduct, which is carbon dioxide or CO2. So CO2 is given off from the tissues and released across the gills into the water. But these are not the fish that we're focusing in on today. We're focusing in on everything fish, which are a lot more extraordinary. And you can see this South American lungfish. I think it just came up for a the bear. But uh, another one up there. Oh, there you go. So we release some bubbles. So it's like, basically, if you or I would take a breath of air, go underwater, and exhale, we would have bubbles coming up. So that's pretty neat. But also leads to the question, why do these fish breathe air? I mean, only one, one and a half percent of all fish should breathe air. Most fish seem to do pretty good with water. While many aquatic environments are actually quite low in oxygen, so they experience hypoxia, which is basically uh, low oxygen, so hypo, low oxia, oxygen. So here I have a couple of different uh, pictures of various uh, aquatic environments. Some of these are very 
one molar in oxygen levels are relatively high, and some of these are very low. Really, these ones that are relatively high in oxygen uh, do not have any vegetation on the surface. They have water turnover, water mixing. Uh, they're generally cooler environments, so they're much a little bit colder, more like what we see around in British Columbia. Where environments that are low in oxygen typically have very slow water turnover, uh, there's lots of vegetation. On, like, you can see this is from uh, Brazil, these like giant lily pads floating on the surface. So you can see there's a very big difference between these two types of environments. Furthermore, oxygen levels can fluctuate throughout the day. So here's uh, oxygen levels, so 100% dashed line. And oxygen levels, depending on the time of the day, can vary. And they can also vary throughout the season, throughout the year. Now this can be a bit of a problem for water breathing fishes. So here we have a couple of salmon migrating upstream. And water breathing fishes uh, do have problems with low oxygen. If you guys were paying attention to the news this summer, you realize that uh, there was a big concern over the salmon population dying off. And a lot of this part of this had to do with because of increasing temperatures lead to reduced oxygen level in the water. So this basically means that sometimes there's just not enough oxygen for these water breathing fishes. So there's a whole bunch of news articles uh, talking about increased temperatures related to low oxygen uh, and how it's going to lead to uh, poor returns on the salmon run. Uh, in California, there was an increase in temperature that led to Severe, uh, severely low oxygen levels in a hatchery that killed 155,000 trout. In Alberta, uh, the trout were struggling to breathe in the warm waters, uh, and which uh, very low oxygen waters. And so, unfortunately, these fish kill due to low oxygen are quite common. Fortunately, not so much in British Columbia, but in various parts of the world where you have more uh, variability in the excuse me, oxygen levels. So here we have uh, this, I'm not actually sure what this is, but it's basically an example of a severe fish die-off due to low oxygen. Fortunately, air breathing fishes have found a way around this problem. So here we have a gar, which is a species of air, uh, well it's actually uh, seven different species of air breathing fish. This is the uh, long nosed gar found in the United States. And uh, these guys are able to breathe air. So, Air is basically a source of unlimited oxygen. So air is composed of about 21% oxygen, with most of the rest being nitrogen. And air, or sorry, oxygen is incredibly more soluble in air. So air, oh sorry, oxygen is about 35 times more soluble than in water. And fortunately for us, oxygen levels do not fluctuate. So if we need a breath of air, we take a breath of air. It doesn't matter the time of day, it doesn't matter time of year, we just breathe and it comes in. So that's what these guys can take advantage of. So I'll just remind you that water breathing fishes take up oxygen and release CO2 across the gills. But air breathing fishes, they take up oxygen at the air breathing organ, or ABO for short. So they take it up, and I'll uh, show you a couple of examples of air breathing organs in a minute. And then uh, take it up at the ABO, go to the tissues. But they still release CO2 at the gill. And I will uh, explain why that is in a few minutes. But first of all, what is an air breathing organ? And are they the same in all air breathing fishes? Well, air breathing has evolved over 70 times in fishing. So unlike for uh, tetrapod, where air breathing has only evolved once and we all have lungs, uh, air, breathing, air breathing fishes has evolved 70 times, which has produced a large variety of air breathing organs. So some of them can use their skin, swim bladder, uh, their mouth, their intestines, their stomach, all sorts of variety of organs. So we, met, we talked about the electric eel already, and these guys actually use a vascularized mouth. So basically their mouth has a whole bunch of holes in it that are produced by blood vessels. So they take a gulp of air, they take a gulp of air and they hold it in their mouth and the oxygen from the air 
diffuses into the blood vessels that are in their mouth. It's almost like a kind of a lung in your mouth. However, lungfish actually do have a lung, hence their name. And their lungs are very similar uh, to our lungs. And so you can see that lung structure there. So again, just like the electric eel, you know, comes up, takes a breath, and then it can release it. So the other three fish that I find uh, some information on, the mud skipper, snake, and beta fish, use a different structure called the suprabranchial chamber, or the labyrinth organ. It's basically a bony structure inside the head that has uh, richly perfused with blood vessels. And they take in air through their mouth and send it to a uh, labyrinth organ where uh, oxygen diffuses from the air into the blood. So oxygen uptake occurs at the air breathing organ. They send it to the tissues, but the CO2 is released at the gill. So this is a bit of a, a, a problem for air breathing fish. Uh, they, they take advantage of the ample air, or the ample oxygen in the air, but they're still stuck to releasing CO2 in the water. Now, they do this because CO2 is incredibly more soluble in water. So it's about 40 times more soluble in water than air, which makes it a lot easier to excrete it into the water. But if you're a mud skipper, you're not in water, so how do you, you can't really release it? So that's a bit of a problem for these guys. Or if you live in places like uh, the swamps of Mississippi or in Brazil, where uh, some of these environments just have naturally high levels of CO2, so they're incredibly high. So normally air has about 0.04% CO2. Some of these environments can get up to 6, 7, 8% CO2. Which basically means that uh, so the uh, excreting CO2 is not easy for these fish, but they can't ventilate their gills, they can't excrete CO2, and if you live in an environment where there's high CO2, CO2 will move from the water to the fish. And these all ultimately mean that CO2 levels increase in the animal. Now, just to provide some background for that, I'm sure everybody heard of like global warming and climate change and all that has to do with CO2. So we know that atmospheric CO2 is increasing. This also means that water CO2 in the ocean and other water bodies are increasing. Now what this does is it reduces the pH of water. So CO2 is an acid. And so the more acid you add, the lower the pH will be. So if you increase the water CO2 in the environment where there's a fish, you're going to acidify the blood pH. So here we have water CO2, and then we have blood pH. So we have a pH of 8 and a pH of 6.8. So basically, it's more acidic on the right hand side, less acidic on the left hand side. So increased CO2, we're acidifying the blood. Now, for us humans, we can only tolerate relatively low levels of CO2. So here, uh, we have uh, CO2 in percentage on this axis. And the first bar shows the max short-term exposure. Now, I took this from the uh, figure from the uh, WorkSafe BC, so Workers Comp BC, and the recommended maximum uh, exposure to CO2 is only about 2%, a little bit less than 2% over a working period. The lethal level is about 10%. So we're exposed to 10% CO2, leads to, uh, we go unconscious, and it can lead to death pretty quick. However, air breathing fishes, they're way better than this. So there's these three species I have here, uh, a couple of uh, alligator gar, spotted gar, and armored catfish, and they easily tolerate over 10% CO2. Bongo's gar and aeroprima, over 20%, so over double what would kill us. And then another three species, all found in Brazil, marble swamp eel, South American lungfish, and electric eel, 
and tolerate at least up to 27%. Now, when I was down in Brazil, we ran into a slight problem. We were um, bubbling in CO2 to see about their CO2 tension, how tolerant they were, and we got to about 27%, and they were still okay. But our machine stopped breathing past that. So like over one quarter of their air that they're breathing is CO2. And it's like, whoa, uh, we can't measure anymore. So we basically just stop the experiment. So it's like pretty crazy. I mean, you know, much, much more tolerant than what we, we'd be long gone. So what this does in most animals is that if you increase the CO2, you acidify the blood. So typically, blood and tissue change in a similar pattern. So you add CO2 to the uh, water that a fish is in, or the air that we're in, it will acidify the blood. Now, when you acidify the blood, this also leads to changes and reductions in brain, muscle, heart, and liver pH. So you also acidify the tissues. This is uh, tends to be a pattern for sharks, most water breathing fishes, birds, reptiles, mammals, so most animals that we think of follow this pattern. Now this is very bad because when you change the pH, you affect the protein structure and its function. So pretty much everything that happens in our body is dependent on protein. And if you change the structure of these proteins, you go from like a nice functional protein that's working properly to a non-functional protein that's basically nonsense. By reducing the pH, your body can't function and it will lead to dysregulation, uh, abnormal, or abnormal function, and possibly death. Now, just to provide some perspective on that, it's almost like cooking an egg. So, think about a freshly cracked egg. If not, hasn't been altered, you just crack it open. Uh, this is a, would be an example of a functional protein. But if you add heat and you cook it, you're basically changing the makeup of it. And that's the same idea with pH. You can basically cook an egg in pH. And there's actually a couple of uh, dishes that people use. I think it's a fish dish that you can actually cook using like lemon juice. So basically you're adding uh, acid to a food item and you're changing the structure of it. So that's the kind of thing that happens in these animals. So with that in mind, why can air breathing fishes tolerate these incredibly high levels of CO2 that are incredibly acidic? So that's one of the questions from my uh, PhD thesis, so it's a portion of that. And so to address this, I looked at pH or acid-base regulation in a variety of air breathing fishes. So one of the things we did was we went down to uh, uh, Mississippi and Texas, and we worked with uh, gar, there's a number of gar species down there. Uh, South America, Brazil. So here's a number of our, our setup. One of the rooms that we had, uh, the lungfish. Uh, we have the armored catfish. Anyways, uh, there's a lot of everybody that fishes down there. I just want to give you an idea of the type of environment that some of these fish live in. So we took a boat through the flooded forest. And uh, this is actually, the water levels are actually about seven or eight meters high here. But they're incredibly hypoxic or low in oxygen and incredibly high in CO2. And you can see it in all this vegetation on the surface. Now, the lungfish and the eel are, and many other fish are, are found in these environments. So this is a pretty normal environment for these fish. And we also uh, did some work in Vietnam. Now in Vietnam, air breathing fishes are incredibly important uh, for food, and quite often uh, a lot of the markets don't have uh, live fish at the market, and they'll just have them in these trays here. It's probably like a little bit of water to keep them moist, but all these fish are alive, and you can go on the market and you can buy, you know, three climbing perch, like, or I don't know, a snakehead, or uh, one of these night fish, and they're all alive. They're just sitting there. You can see them kind of breathing. Uh, anyway, you can take home fresh fish. That's really useful in a country that's uh, electricity is kind of intermittent and uh, it just, uh, it's just not really feasible to have all the, uh, the fancy supermarkets that we have here. 
So we uh, example what we did. So we put these fish in these uh, buckets and we bubbled in CO2. Now I mentioned that the South American lungfish are incredibly CO2 tolerant. So this is our uh, contraption that we use to uh, measure CO2. And the units are different. We measure CO2 in millimeters of mercury, which is commonly used for like blood pressure and stuff. But on this side is zero CO2. And we went all the way up here to over 200 millimeters of mercury, which is over 27%. When we got to this point, kind of like, uh, I don't really know what to do here. I mean, you can't, I mean, you guess you can keep bubbling in CO2, but you have no idea how much. So we had to kind of call the day with that. But we found some really cool stuff when we measured blood and tissue pH, we found that in air breathing fishes, tissue pH is not affected by blood pH. So in air breathing fishes, blood pH still falls, so the blood is still acidified during high CO2. But the brain, muscle, heart, and liver, their acid-base balance, their pH does not change. So basically everything is fine. They're happy, their blood affected, but all the important stuff is fine. That explains, one of the main reasons that explains why these fish are still moving around, swimming, and not flopped over dead. So that's pretty cool. So this ability to regulate the pH of its tissue allows air breathing fishes to tolerate severe acid-base disturbances, such as those caused by high CO2. So, but what's the big deal about like, being CO2 tolerant, studying these fish? Well, pH regulation and CO2 tolerance are important for many key evolutionary events. One of the, things, one of the reasons we study these fish is to uh, learn about how vertebrates evolved from life in the water to life on land. So we can learn about the transition from marine environment to fresh water Regulating uh, your acid base or pH balance in the ocean is much easier than in fresh water for reasons that I won't get into, but because some fishes are able to protect their tissue pH, they can make this transition. They can make uh, way into new habitats. The other cool thing is that because they're able to protect their tissue pH, you're able to utilize marginal habitats where there's less competition for resources. So here we have an environment where there's like high oxygen, low CO2, probably a lot of fish species. In here, it's really hard to get food and stuff. But if you're able to take advantage of habitat that nobody else can, like this over here, you can do really well. And that's because they're able to regulate their pH so good. That's very cool. And changes to pH regulation, CO2 tolerance, are ex-adaptation ex for air breathing. So basically, this is a fancy word for pre-adaptation. So basically, because they have the ability to protect their pH and be really tolerant to CO2, they're able to be, uh, more likely breathe air. So it's kind of uh, nothing ever really pre uh, evolves adaptation for something in the future. But it just happens that this, these particular traits are very useful for air breathing. So now this fish can take advantage of all this air that we're breathing. And ultimately, these changes allow fish and their ancestors to become independent of water, allowing them to become a terrestrial. So we can look at the, the transition from life in the water to life on land. So things like the mud skipper is kind of a good example. You got a fish, uh, kind of like a fish that you know it's kind of moving on from there. You know, it's a very nice looking uh, tetrapod thing. <laughs> so I'm just going to finish up with saying that air breathing fishes are way cool because they are, can help us understand the evolution of life from water to land and some of the adaptations required for that monumental evolutionary event. And I just want to acknowledge everybody that's kind of uh, participated in some of these projects and stuff.